If, um, if you go around and you, um, uh, you were to do a survey with people and you were to ask them to describe a successful church, the answer uh, that you will usually uh, receive uh, will be in the following terms. A successful church is a big church. Big church. You know, we think of, you know, you, you, you have, you have uh, relatives that come from uh, out of town and maybe they're not even members of the church and you want to, you know, you want to kind of show them around. You want to impress them, you know. Uh, you're not going to take them to uh, um, a congregation of 12 members and there are some house churches and smaller congregations about in Oklahoma. You're not going to take them over there, that little building, you know. No, you, you, you're going to want to impress them, right? You're going, to, you're going to take them out to Edmond and you're going to drive them around you know, Memorial Road and you know, say, yeah, look at this. This is the church of God. Look at that. Look how big it is. You know, wow, they're impressed. They're a big church. Or a successful, a successful church is, a, is an active church. Programmed. We got it. We got youth. We got, we got every slice of the church busy, active. Successful. And you know what? I mean, these factors are certainly, certainly part of a church's character. You know, big is not bad. I've always said big churches can do big things. It's good. So part of the character. But if someone asked me to describe you know, my dream congregation, here's what I would say. I would say that I want our congregation to be a glorious church. Not just big, not just busy. Glorious. Because you can have a glorious church of 12 or you can have a glorious church of 12,000. Because the glory part remains. So I want to talk about the glorious church tonight. We know what the word church means, of course. In our Bible classes, we have learned that it comes from a Greek word which means to be called out, the called out. Those who are called out or separated from a group to form a new and special group. The word was originally used to describe those who were selected to serve as town leaders, men who sat at the gate. Jesus came along, he appropriated this very common word and he used it to describe his disciples who were called out of the world to form a special group, the saved. And from that time forward, this special group of called out and saved people, they have been referred to as the church, more specifically the church that belongs to Jesus. That's why we are what? The church of Christ. We belong to Christ. We're the called out that belong to Him. Now, what does the word glorious mean? Well, the word glorious comes from a root word, glory, which refers to the honor one gets because of one's person or actions. Glory equals magnificence. In the Bible, it is basically used to describe the level and the quality of God's character and God's works. They're glorious. For example, His works are not merely good. They're not just excellent. They're beyond that. They're glorious. They're magnificent. They're beyond comparison. And so the Bible speaks of God, who in different ways. It says, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, Exodus 15, 11. Another passage, thou art more glorious and excellent, speaking of God, Psalm 76, 4. It also speaks of what God has done. His work is honorable and glorious. The psalmist says in Psalm 111, 3. The Bible also describes other things as glorious. The power of Jesus is glorious, Colossians 1, 11. The freedom enjoyed by Christians 
is glorious, Roman 8, 21, Romans 8, 21. The gospel message is the glorious gospel message, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, and the glorious church of Christ, Ephesians 5, 27. So the church that I want, the church that I'm working to build up, the church that I want to be a part of when our Lord comes, if He comes during my lifetime, that church, that's the glorious church that Paul talks about in Ephesians. And he says that Jesus might present to Himself, not just the church, it says, but that Jesus might present to Himself the glorious church. That's why I want us to be the glorious church. So now that we have a little idea of what the individual words church and glory mean, what do they represent when we use these two words together? In other words, what does the glorious church look like? We know what churches look like, right? Buildings usually different in architecture than others, and there's usually a big room where everybody sits, and then there are other rooms, classrooms. So, you know, we know what the building looks like. That's not what I'm talking about. Big or small buildings. What does the church, what does this glorious church look like? In still other words, make it a little more personal. How does the Choctaw church that belongs to Christ become the glorious Choctaw Church of Christ. Too late to change the sign, right? <laughs> We've already got the money spent and the time it took to get it going. So the transformation from being just a church to being the glorious church requires a very real and sustained effort in at least three important areas. And those are the things I want to share with you tonight, briefly. Number one, we need to be the glorious church in our conduct. Our conduct needs to outshine the conduct of the world. Pretty basic Bible stuff, right? Our personal speech and habits have to be clean and pure. Our treatment of others needs to move them to praise God because of it. I've done good if I've done something for someone and they just say thank you to me, but I've done really good if I do something for someone and they praise God because of it. Now I've hit the home run, now I've hit the target. Because I'm no longer the object of their gratitude. But God becomes the object of their gratitude. A, a tricky thing to do, right? Our love for one another has to be such that it impresses others who witness it. How did Jesus say that all men would know that we're His disciples? That we attended a big church? That we were busy? No, He says, this is how all men will know that you are my disciples, in the way that you love one another. He didn't even say in the way you love the poor. He didn't say in the way that you love the world or you love the lost. He says in the way you love one another, that's how people will know that you're my disciples. Why? Because if you can't love a brother or sister in Christ, how are you going to love a stranger? If we can't love people who are equally yoked with us in searching to uh, do the will of God, if we can't love that person, how, how are we going to lo love unbelievers? We have to be better than the Boy Scouts if we're going to be glorious. We have to be kinder and more generous than the local charity workers if we are to be glorious. We have to love each other more than they do at the places where veterans gather or the Kiwanis members or cheers. If we want to be glorious. You know, the world sees our conduct as the witness of our faith, but it also sees our conduct as the power of our Lord. And if it is not glorious in their eyes, well then neither is our message glorious and neither is our Savior 
glorious. Number two, in order to be the glorious Choctaw church that belongs to Christ, we need to be glorious in our worship. Little shout out to Bob Aldridge, didn't know we were going to talk about this. We were just talking about this before services. You know, the glory of our worship is not based on how loud it is, or how well organized it is, or how fancy it is, or how many people attend, although, although it is inspiring, is it not? When Bob uh, uh, Chilton leads us in that song that we love so well, you know, it is well with my soul. Boy, when we get around to that third verse there, I mean, you know, it's like we've been cranked up to go. It's just the church is lifted up and the sound of voices. Everybody's singing. They get caught up in it. It's wonderful. It's glorious. But it isn't glorious because it's loud. Our worship is glorious if we are truly offering it to God and that it is something that He's pleased with, something that He finds acceptable. And so our worship becomes glorious when it is done according to His will and word. That we sing when we worship makes it glorious, not that we're hitting all the right notes and not that we would embellish our voices with instruments and things like that, as is the mindset of so many in the organized religious world. We could just make all of this sound better if we just you know, enhanced it somehow. They don't get it. They see public worship as a form of entertainment and the better the show, the more acceptable somehow it becomes to God. Wow, what backwards thinking is that? Our worship becomes glorious when it's done in a heartfelt or sincere manner. Brothers and sisters, if we cannot in our minds and in our hearts be saying to God, Lord, I love you so much, while we're with 300 people singing to Him, when could we say such a thing? When? And it's glorious when it is done on a consistent basis in our lives. Remember I said in a class a little while back, Sunday is our chance to all come together as a body you know, to do what we're normally doing by ourselves during the week. By myself during the week, I am reading His word and I am carving out a time to pray and not while I'm at the office because while I'm at the office doesn't matter I'm a minister that's not that's my work time that's not my quiet time not the time I'm going to read my personal Bible it's not the time I'm going to pray for my personal things that's work time I do that at home after work that's my time that's the way I want to spend my time not all of it but a portion of it So on my time, I'm telling him, Lord, I love you. And I'm thankful. What a life that you've given me. You've given me this great life here on earth and I'm going to heaven on top of that. How great is that? How marvelous is that? How blessed is that? How unworthy am I to receive that from you? I don't deserve it, Lord, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Sunday is just the time that me and Ron and Lise and Leslie and you know, where we all get together of one mind and we lift up our voices together to tell Him what we've been telling Him all week long. And it's glorious. It's made glorious because it's the thing that we continually do and now that we do together. Glorious worship pleases God and it builds up the church spiritually and yes, emotionally. Sometimes people say, you know, emotion is a dirty word. Emotion has no place in religion. Really? Have you read your Bible lately? What's all this? I'm, I sing with joy or I glory. Where, where? Those are feelings, folks. <laughs> I hope that I have feelings in heaven or else how am I going to experience joy, peace? You know, how am I going to know that? 
glorious worship builds us up emotionally. No matter how young or old or how new or experienced we are as Christians, we can offer glorious worship to God. Those babies that we bring in and they're just crying and talking and this and that, they're in the assembly. Those voices are pleasing to God because they are brought here through the faith of parents. Our elders and teachers are leading us in song and prayer leading. And they're doing this in a proper biblical form of worship. And that's okay because that's their responsibility. I love to see the young boys run down the aisles and pick up the cards, right? For them it's just, I get to run a little bit. <laughs> I get to run off some steam, you know? that's what it is for them. But for us, as we watch them, who are we seeing there? We're seeing that little guy just picking up the cards, transform into the young Owen boy standing here and leading us in communion. To a Mike Coghill who takes on an important, uh, an important responsibility in the church as a minister commended by the church and the leaders of the church to serve and minister to some of the older guys like Marty and I and then on to the deacons and on to the all of this makes for a glorious church. So it's up to each member to provide the sincere heart and the faithful attendance in order to make this offering complete. Worship is the church's opportunity to glorify God as a community, as a body. It is the only time when the entire universal church is fixed on the same glorious objective, and that is to praise and worship God. Coming to church to see your buddies is good, but it better not be the first thing. It better not be the thing that you look forward to the most. It is truly a glorious moment because the entire kingdom of God in heaven and the kingdom of God on earth are bound together in the same thought and purpose. And that is to worship the Father and the Son in the power and in the direction of the Holy Spirit. When we come together to worship, we're, we're, everything is worshiping God at that moment. And it is truly glorious because at worship the line between light and dark, spiritual and secular, lost and saved, here and hereafter is drawn clearly for everyone in heaven and on earth to see. We know who we are, we know what we're doing, and those who witness what we're doing also know. And so in order to be the glorious church, we must be here to participate with an obedient, sincere, and faithful heart along with all the saints. Every absence, every distraction, every difference between what you sing and pray and what you actually think and do diminishes the glory of our worship by that much. You know, it's interesting <clears throat> for those who greet, and sometimes I stay back there to greet people coming in, you know. And you greeters, you know, you can, I, I think you can confirm this. I'm happy with every person that comes in. You know what I'm saying? I mean, after all, this is a church of Christ, and so nobody's here 25 minutes ahead of time except the deacons charged with opening the door and the minister is scrambling to get their last minute stuff together, right? But if you're a greeter, if you've ever had that experience, every person coming in, yeah, good, good. Oh, and then you're looking out at the parking lot and you're seeing a lot of cars starting to park. All right, now we're talking now. People are coming in, right? And now people are coming in, the clap, ding, the bell goes, you know, and the classes start. 
But the, the greeters that are lingering, because we tell them, you know, stay out there you know, for folks that are late, and, you know, or visitors, many times visitors, they don't arrive early, they arrive right on time or a little bit after, you know, make sure somebody's to greet them. I don't know about you greeters, but me, when, I, when that happens and I'm, I'm out there, I'm always happy, it's like, well, it looks like everybody's in, I need to go and close the door and I look back, oh, one more. There's one more coming in. Everyone that shows up gives me a jolt of happiness. One more person's going to praise God. One more member made the decision to come. Even if they're late, even if something happened, they're still going to be there. Visitors, wow, visitors are coming. I'm happy for every single person that comes to worship God. And I'm saddened when I see someone that is normally here, not here, for whatever reason. Because everyone added adds to the glory and everyone subtracted takes away from the glory. And finally, one other thing, to be the glorious church, we need to be glorious in our actions. You know, Luke's second book is called The Acts of the Apostles because in it he recorded the glorious things that they and the church did in spreading the gospel and serving other people. So we need to serve in such a way that future generations will write a book of Acts of the Choctaw Church of Christ. Not just our history when we started and when we moved the building and things like that, but the things that we did in 2000 and whatever, we, we found a young preacher, in, a young man in Kenya with a family who had a desire to preach the gospel. And we educated that young guy. We sent him to college in South Africa to get his degree and to get his training. And we stuck with him for several years, just paid him to go to school. And then he graduated, he went out in the field. And we supported it again. And we bought him a motorbike so he could get to more remote villages. Then we bought him a car. And now that young guy, you know, he's married, he has two teenage daughters, and he circuit preaches among eight or nine churches, many of which he himself established. And he's the principal of the Maru Theological School where he's training, he and other teachers are training other preachers, other Kenyan preachers who will go out into the field. We did that. There's not our church and six others that did that. We did that. The Choctaw Church of Christ did that. Found him, trained him, sent him out, supported and continued to support him. That's our history. And I can't even begin to name the people, the places, the churches established and run by people who were first contacted by our World Bible School program. How many, never mind hundreds, how many thousands of people owe their life in Christ to the people here who corrected their work and sent them notes and so on and so forth. And Jean Elmira in Haiti. You see what I'm saying? That's our history. Our history isn't just we went in this building and then we met in this building. You know, that's our history, but our history is what we have done. And then of course in more recent years, and you know about this, BibleTalk.tv brings the gospel everywhere. The whole world, right from here, a little Choctaw America. I say when I go speak somewhere, I tell them I'm the guy who's got a name that nobody can pronounce from a place that nobody's heard of. But you may not have heard of us, but I guarantee you there are thousands of lost souls who have heard of us and who are now in Christ because of us and preaching the gospel because of us and belonging to churches that we helped plant through the people that we encouraged and trained. And I'm not even going to get into the individuals in this church who serve as deacons and ministers, retired ministers, although I don't think Dayton's retired yet, but 
Shall we write a book about everything and every country that Dayton has gone? And all the work that Bud has done? And our, you know, I mean, that's our history. And so if we preach the word to our community and our state and the world using the communication tools at our disposal, if we faithfully teach our children and our adults to obey the words of Christ, if we work hard to make everyone feel part of our Christian family and serve those in need in or out of the congregation, what happens if we do that and continue to do that? Well then we become a beacon of pure, intense light in a dark and fearful world. Then we will become that city set on the hill that all will see and be drawn to. Brothers and sisters, the world is so very tired of phony religion and service that always has a catch to it. The world is hungry for the glorious church of Christ to show itself. And as far as this part of the country and this part of the county is concerned, we're that thing, we're that light. We've been called to be that light. So I said at the beginning that some people see a successful church as big and active. And this is true in part. What I've tried to explain is that a glorious church usually is blessed with growth and opportunity to serve. In other words, glory comes before size and expanded responsibility. Now I've heard some people say, that they're afraid that if we get too big, we're going to lose our family feeling, we're going to lose our loving spirit. I hear that all the time. What if Choctaw, what if like every Sunday there was a thousand people here and we had to have two services or three services and add staff and expand? What if that happens? And it can, have you noticed the construction going on around here? And people always say, oh, we got a nice little group, we're tight, you know, we know everybody, blah, blah, blah. I want to tell you that the thing that kills a loving family feeling is sin, not size. Sin is what kills the love, not how big you are. If we continue to love the brother and sister next to us, size is not going to change us. And so the Lord calls us to be His glorious church. It is our ultimate goal. It is our final form. Why? Because Paul says so. He will present to God, Jesus will present to God what? The glorious church. That's who we are. That's who we're becoming. That's what the sermons are about. That's what the exercises are for. That's what the classes lead us to. That's what the elders demand of us spiritually. It's what the deacons are serving towards. So if you've not lived in this glorious way and you'd like to begin a glorious life in Christ, certainly the first step, repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus, perhaps you need to start over, then let us minister to you, whether it be in baptism or in prayer or counseling, whatever. Many different individuals here, not only the elders, the deacons, the ministers, but also many of our members here ready to help, ready to support you, ready to encourage you, whatever you need. Think about it, make a decision, and if you need to respond in some way, then we do encourage you to do that now, as Harold leads us in a aptly termed song of encouragement. Brother Harold.